thank you so much for doing this interview. Can I first ask you, I've got some quick fire questions about James Bond. Okay, so my first one is, whether or not you've worked on them or whether or not you just like them, what's your favourite James Bond film? Spy Who Me. For me, I think Moonraker. Okay. Favourite James Bond book that you read? Thunderball. Ditto that. I, Thunderball, yes. Favourite James Bond that you worked with? I have to say Roger. Yes, me too. It has to be Roger. Favourite James Bond girl that you worked with? Marion Darber. Barbara Bach. Can I just start, can I just start before we get finish these? Why Mariam Darbo? Why Barbara Bach? For, for, for me, Barbara Bach, it was one of the prettiest. And I suppose because it was my first Bond, she was the one that sort of made the great impression upon me. And I think, you know, that's, that's my rationale for that uh, observation. Was she, was she easy to work with? She, she was very new to... Uh, she was very new. She was very nervous. But... Um, uh, dear old um, Lewis, uh, you know, calmed her down and sort of, I think she did very well in the movie, given that, you know, it was her first Bond movie. What's the matter, sailor? You never see a major taking a shower before? And Marion Darbo, why do you... Well, because we, we had such a lot of uh, contact with her because of the playing of the cello and things like that and I got to know her quite well I seem to think I knew her quite well and and as you're watching on a movie or looking at her face and big close-up you can see every little movement of her eyes and her lips and she just became she was so different I think she was pretty lovely girl she's a good actress as well wasn't she I mean she had yes. to play in innocence and yes very good. And she yeah. learned to play the cello, believe it or not. Wow. I mean, the only sections of it. But she was, really, uh, she was a good girl. I liked her a lot. Saw her not very long ago. Did I get it right? Mm, perfect. Favourite scene in the series that either you worked on or that you liked? What's the one that stands out for you? Oh, my God. The favourite scene? Or one that you cut or one well, that... The one, uh, <coughs> oh, blimey, that was probably on Octopussy, which was the massive, massive amount of film of a, of a chase sequence. I can't even... And all about the railway at the end and the cars and going over rail tracks before he's shot at the end. Mm. And that was such a lot to put together because John, John Glenn... I mean, and, and Arthur, who did all the second unit stuff, was, was there's so much material to try and get a piece of every shot in. And it became a, a, a well, I thought a montage, a wonderful montage using every shot he'd done. We didn't change very much of it, I must say, and John was very good to me in that respect because working for a, a director who was an editor, he's critical of every single bloody shot you do. Yeah, but he's all, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, favorite, favorite scene? Um, favorite scene takes in a whole reel, uh, once again, coming back to Moonraker, um, because uh, the thing about Moonraker is it had all the earthly in adventures but the, the first time in space, and uh, as we know, there is no sound in space, but that's no good for a Bond movie. So it was coming up with and creating the sounds for the space complex. Gravity, normal conditions. Life support system, nominal. And the battle that uh, ensued uh, for the climax of the movie. Was it hard working in France? Because they decided to go over there for monetary reasons. Were you doing mainly mo your stuff in... He didn't go to France. Well, only no, for, only for, a, lips, only for a short period. Day trips. Day trips. They, yes. they came out for a decent meal yes. and to get them pissed. <laughs> That's, no, true. that's true. No, um, John and John were, you know, were cutting in, in France, and, and and my colleague Alan Sons and myself, we were working back at Pinewood, 
as John, as the two Johns completed a sequence that was shipped to us, uh, we would do a tap dub on it. Then we would then fly over to show it to the Johns, uh, get the, the feedback on it, and take the, the new sequence that they've been currently working on back to Pinewood. So it was a series of uh, to and fro to, to visit them. But we were very fortunate enough to, on our, one of our final trips, to coincide with the uh, rap party in Paris, which was held at Regine's nightclub, which at the time was the nightclub in Paris. The company took over the whole nightclub up to midnight, and then the, the Parisians came in after that. But it was a wonderful, wonderful party. You have arrived at a propitious moment coincident with your country's one indisputable contribution to Western civilization. Afternoon tea. If we can just jump back to the, the first Bond films that you both worked on, you, the first Bond Spy film you were inspired me. Yeah. How did you get the gig and what was it like working on Spy? Well, I'd, I'd worked on some huge pictures, so it didn't worry me because of the amount of film or how big it was. I mean, I'd, I'd done something for John on, and he was happy and, and when it came to he got that picture, he said, would I like to come on it? And that's how I got it. No, no, I mean, I was a well-known assistant. I was always working. And you'd, you'd done 2001, you'd done... Chivago. Chivago. Grand Prix was the biggest one for an editor. Really? Yeah. Was that... the amount of film. <sighs> God, anyhow, that's another story. No, I did lots of lovely pictures. Sure. So, as an assistant. But James, I need you. So does England. Well, first of all, I came on because we had this, the, the, the sequence of the parachute jump, you know, what was done, and that was all going wrong because they were all, John was stuck out there with Alan Hume and the camera crew, and the film wasn't coming in. I was in the cutting rooms preparing, waiting for film, and it didn't come in because they couldn't shoot it. And then, I mean, Cubby... I suppose they tried to stop. I'm trying to think who the line producer was. It Bill Cartlidge? I can't remember. I think it was Bill, Bill Cartlidge. Cartlidge yeah. he, he, was, he was all for wrapping it and bringing them home. But Cubby was the one that said, no, stick it out, they'll get it. And they did. And that was one of the most... Big. But today, you see, you could do that so easily. You would just... You, you, I mean, that was for real. This is what people don't believe. Today, everything is done digitally. And when you see it, they say that the... There were three cameras on it. Yeah, only, only one, one got, got the. Only one got it. One, yeah. Only one got the whole no, full. Yeah. What, did you? Which order did you see them in? Did you? Did you all get panicky? That oh you, no, they knew oh, right. from out there they'd got it, and they just had did the labs, process it. Did the lab scratch it? Was it all okay in the camera? Because they can't tell that. Was there a hair in the gate? No, there wasn't. <laughs> Well, I mean, the story later on that Maurice Binder said, I've got to have that sequence for my teaser trailer, which it goes, and when he was using it, he put a fine scratch on it. Mm. And that was, you know, really damn. The labs got rid of it, they polished it out, but that was Maurice uh, <coughs> making a small blunder there. Wouldn't matter today because it's scratchy, just take it out, yeah. Oh, what a pity it is you persist in being so businesslike. My first one was Spy, then um, For Your Eyes Only, and then Moonraker. But the thing about Moonraker was, as I uh, said earlier, that uh, you had all the normal challenges of what is involved in a Bond film, but suddenly having a space scene as well presented extra challenges which, uh, which, which we had to address. And the, the thing about it was, um, once the, that the whole space uh, scene was put together, which took ages creating all the sound effects for it, and uh, we then mixed it in the in the dubbing theatre, and then came the time to play back for Cubby and Lewis, and uh, I, my, I I think we were we were in double reels then, so we were running to talking about 18 minutes of multiple sound effects through this whole 18 minutes. And I was very nervous about running it, this whole scenario. Mm. 
lights went down, we ran it, the lights went up, and Louis, I can remember Lewis, bless him, said, I think that's the best space scene I've ever seen. And Cubby turned to me and said, thank you, Colin. That's good. Well, he always, was always generous. No, no, he was always he generous. Was but the thing about it was, there were so many elements there that could have said, well, I like this, but can you try that? And vice versa. I don't like this and, and I don't like that. But as luck would have it, it was accepted, I think, 99% for what it was and the way we mixed it. It's entering Earth's atmosphere. James, this is our last chance. Steady. also has to balance with the music and that yes. was a John Barry. Yes. What was it like working with Barry? Because he has a reputation of being, being difficult. I mean, he had a, a big... Oh. <laughs> what was he like when he went on Moonraker? Well, uh, I have a thing about the music in Moonraker. Oh, sounds I, like something personally, else. Personally, I do not feel that John met uh, John Barry met the, the challenges of the film itself. It was Personally. a very similar score. It was just very repetitious. There was, I didn't feel he'd uh, underlined the excitement of the scene, personally speaking. He didn't have a lot of time either. Oh, that, well, that may have That is always the problem. Factor. I mean, we, we start on a film, you know, and you're told the day you've got to deliver it. Well, if they go behind, or the picture's not ready, or they don't shoot it, we don't get any more time. It's just goes. But why they? Why did they always? I mean, for the Man with the Golden Gun, he only had three weeks to do the, the soundtrack, the, the music. Why did they give him so little time? With well, we temp dubbed it anyhow. Temp music. I mean, we use we mm. because that's the great thing about a Bond. There's so much of his traditional type of music. So we would use it from old records or old John Barry stuff, so he had to just, well, not copy it, but... And it could be that also that maybe he'd been working on something else and only had three weeks, a three-week window. Follow that car. Was there a lot of dialogue between the director and, and yourself and the composer about where the Bond theme comes in? Because when it does, it just feels quite right, but you can't overuse it. Was there a lot of discussion throughout when well, you were I pacing? Think, I think that comes from the cutting rooms, isn't it? Yes. We, we set it up and, you know, and, and the pictures cut to the music. Then so you, you, decide, really, you decide what... Well, I or the John or, or, or Lewis even. Sometimes. Yes, I mean, uh, John would sort of would lead the discussion and Lewis would sort of say yes or no. And so Alan Killick, we, did we have Alan yeah. on that? No, no, no he no. came on later. No. They, they, would have, they would have put it in when we had... But the great thing about Bonds is that we had our sound crew on so early. Mm. You know, they came on probably six weeks after we'd started. Because to do, once stuff was put together, it was temp dubbed. Mm. And, and that... The temp Sometimes the temp dub is better than the final. Affected the cutting. Yeah. You know, if, if, if there was time to establish a particular sound effect or uh, reduce the size of a cut because you don't need to leave that space for this, um, that, that, that's often dictated the, the speed of the cut itself. We used to dub the rushes. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes, where, where there were the, the sort Gunshots of or dull, bombs dull or anything like that. Dull, dull, you know, special effects explosion. We would just cut in the sound effect of a real explosion. And the same applied to the gunshots yeah. as well. I suppose it makes people um, appreciate... Well, no, we did it for yes. Cubby. Oh, yes. <laughs> we did it for Cubby, so yes. you'd have exciting rushes. Yes, yes. So, uh, of, of all the, the composers that you worked with, who was, who was your favourite and who was the nightmare? Of the ones. Ooh, well, Marvin Hamlisch was definitely my favourite. Why? Because he was so talented. Mm. Very original. Mm. Uh, well, at least I, I, I thought he was. That's my own personal yeah, opinion. Yeah. Who, 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 was um, who was Conti? Bill Conti. Uh, Bill Conti. I, I thought he did a very good job. Uh, yeah. I didn't think he did. Oh, I, I didn't. Yeah, it's, it's a difference of opinion. Everyone has. 
but in okay. working with them, were there some more demanding than others from the from the sound and from the, the oh, yeah. editing point of view? Sure. Who's, who's the most demanding? Marvin Hamlish. Yes, <laughs> he was lovely. He'd give me a call at four o'clock and well, three o'clock. No, was it three o'clock one morning? The phone went. <laughs> What, what are you doing? I mean, this was on, on Spy. And because I was the assistant and went on to the music because I knew the picture as well, I, or somebody else couldn't get on with him, mm. and I could. And he said, you've got to come up to town. And I mean, I lived in the country, and so I had to get drive up to London and go and see him to hear the first version of, of For Your Eyes Only. Uh, sorry, not for um, no, that's that's another picture. Sorry, nobody does, it nobody does it better with, and the little the little tiny voice that she had, but it was fantastic. And then he said, "What do you think of this?" And oh, three o'clock in the morning, he'd been working all night like they do. So, oh, that's a Freudian slip. Why did I say that? For your eyes only, because that was another that one. Was that was Bill Conti. Yes, yeah, Bill Conti. Yeah. And well, it wasn't really. That was. Did Bill Conti write that? Wasn't uh, that he, he Sheena write, Easton? He, he, Sheena Easton wrote that song, but Bill Conti did all the did all the orchestration yeah. for it because that's that's you hear that today. It's brilliant. Some yeah. of some of it is yeah. there's, there's a sequence which you cut, which I love, which is the um, the chase with the motorbikes <laughs> and the music to that yeah. and the cutting and the way it was shot is just fantastic. And it's all all second unit again. One of the things about the Roger Moore films that saddened me slightly is there's always a shot somewhere in the film which is a very bad process shot. Oh yeah, well we didn't have the facilities then. I mean it was all done back projection which was a 35 mil print projected against the screen mm. and, and Roger sitting up there doing this <laughs> with, with... Waving his arms about. Yeah, waving his arms about. And that's why it was so short. We only... <laughs> yeah. So well, I mean... What's your, what, what's your memories of, your favourite memories of, of Sir Roger? Is, it, is it ones you can tell? Yeah, can yeah, remember? okay. <laughs> That's the problem. I suppose there were some good times with that. I, I suppose were all the jokes that Roger oh, played, yeah. sort of, uh, they do a number of, ta number of takes and there'd be another take and Roger would sort of pull a gag of some kind or other. But then he would do it properly. You know, if it, if it was going wrong, he would pull a gag, and it would just cut and then shoot, shoot it again and he, do it correctly. He, he loved the cutting rooms. He actually liked it because he'd come and see stuff because he knew that we could sort out a lot of his faults because you know he couldn't run. No, absolutely awful. He didn't like firing guns because he'd go. <laughs> so you take that out. If you, if you run the film frame, you see a frame of white cut in. If you run it frame by frame, you can see. Well, that's, that's just a cutting mm. gimmick. But he was a joy to, a joy to work with. He didn't like post-sync. He wasn't very good at it, was he? Uh, he didn't particularly enjoy it, no. And he used to come in, especially when Lewis and John were there. Oh, that, yes. was, that was a dreadful part. We were all there, all sort of ex helping him. And he do one take two, that's all right then. And Lewis said, yes, next. Yeah. And, and who was it, Derek, uh, uh, Derek uh, Holding said, to say, no, I, we've no, got we, to go we've again. We've got to go again, can you fix it? And John, and then John Glenn, who used to be a sound editor many years ago, he'd say, oh, you can fix that. Yes. And you think, well, fuck me, oh, sorry, you can't. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to get the proper, you've got to get the lines in. Yes. Builders. You edited The Living Daylights, which has this pre-credit sequence where they introduced Timothy Dalton. Yeah. Tim, Tim was very good. He did a lot of very dangerous stuff there. I mean, when we showed the rushes, Cubby was petrified, you know, because he was hanging on the top of this vehicle. I imagine he was on the safety line, but um, I don't think the insurance company would have liked it. But I don't know, he, he, he was, I mean, we tried to make, to make him as masculine because he wanted to be, uh, you know, change the Bond theme. And, and I was used to Roger. Roger would have sat up there with a big grin and, mm. and you'd, you'd then have Martin Grace 
dive into the vehicle. You know, he's double, he looks just like Roger anyhow. There's, there's a, uh, Today it would be very different. That but it still big, stands up, I mean, it's a great Yeah, because sequence. it was all done for real, it was on yeah. film. And it's just, it just it, it's a really good way of introducing the new, the new Bond. Well, apart from that girl on the boat, she wasn't very good. It's all so boring here, Margo. There's nothing but playboys and tennis pros. If only I could find a real man. I need to use your phone. She'll call you back. Who are you? Bond, James Bond. Exercise control 007 here. I'll report in an hour. Won't you join me? Better make that two. So there's a, there are two takes that were ta taken of that, or maybe more. One is used in the trailer, and one is used yeah. in the film. Do you have any memory of... Well, I, oh, you're asking me. I can't, Cause it, cause I can't it, cause it, the, Some people actually yeah. can see the difference in the performance, and they think yeah. the performance is better in the, in the trailer one. I mean, she was a girl with, you know, she looked lovely, but she wasn't. Did we revoice her? Yes, we revoiced her. Well, it help because... No, that was. I, I found that slightly embarrassing. I mean, if if you landed, just the whole idea of somebody coming in, she'd be petrified for a start. And it was all as if it's anyhow. It it works, and it was fun. They laughed, and as Cubby said, one laugh is worth a million dollars. <laughs> so if you get a laugh, yes. however corny it is, yes. that was it. So, editing a film like that. Binder, Morris Binder, seemed to have a reputation for late delivery. How much of a nightmare was it for you to have these amazing not, not titles? Not for us, but for the premiere, because the, the, the main title is on the front of the film, and, and the print's been made. And on one picture, I can't remember which Bond it was, we actually joined the print up in the box for the premiere. And that was, I mean, we'd seen it and we knew it would work, but it was always that... That's the way he played. He, he was, he got the song late. The song was your music, or the song was usually being titivated and played and a lot before he got it. So then he would change and, was, and he'd shoot more film than a main unit sometimes on one film. Especially if the girls are particularly pretty. Oh, yeah. Well, they did. Yes, what was the one though on roller uh, skates? Oh, I wonder what you were going to say. Oh, no. Well, they were all in the nude because yes. he was kinky. He, <laughs> he liked them all in the nude, so they did it all in the nude. I mean, these girls, cheapers, cripers. And then the, we had sensor problem on some of those too because you weren't allowed to show any pubic hair or, or nether regions, which mm. nowadays would all be accepted. Mm. And they were, you know... But was it was it was there was there anger because he was delivering it late, or was it just that he had his own issues? Was it was it a well, the, the yeah, anger would have been you know waiting for the premier or Cubby or John or you know or whoever was are we going to make it Lewis or something who was going to make it delivering and, uh, it on time. I mean, for us as an editing side, I mean, you know, when it came in, we were there ready to we'd got all the gear sure. all ready to put it on. So it must be quite brought to put it in in the projection box. And oh, yeah. As luck would have it, it, didn't, that only happened just the once. And we, didn't, we didn't have a disaster at any premiere. No. We did on one, one picture I worked on, Chicago, on 70 mil, the premiere in Los Angeles. On the first changeover, there was a big bang upstairs and everything went black and it stopped. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, 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 we're going yeah, away from the bond. No, no yes. this this was a true story. I mean, that was in in whatever cinema it was, and I was sitting with Norman Savage, the editor, and David Lean, and my wife, and this, that, and the other, and we looked at each other and thought, what? The? And then 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 I get a jab from, and I had to go out and try and find what had happened the, on the mechanical changer with seventy mil. A, a, a gearbox had gone or something, and the projectionist, although it took eight minutes to change it, he did a fantastic job changing that over. You know, it was a big oh, mechanical yeah. thing to do because there's only two projectors. But the um, time I got up to the box there, he, he, you know, this poor guy, he got it running, running again. 
So no, that was disaster. But uh, no, no we, back to we never had we never had that with a bond. No, no, we always a bond premieres have always gone yeah. like clockwork. Absolutely terrific. But it must have been quite a heartrending moment to just. No, oh, yeah, we all we did for the body. You've seen the picture so many times. You're just waiting for people to jump. You're just you know, watching everybody, and you know what's coming up. And there's a big bang, and then people do this, and which is lovely. Or that's it. And or if it doesn't work, sometimes you Could, know when you cut it so fast, you can't. People don't laugh. Did you with with, with spe uh, sequences? Were they so storyboarded in terms of the chase sequences? that it didn't give you much elbow room to, to change the Well, pace. we had the storyboards, but I mean, I didn't necessarily cut to that. It's just that, so you got the directions right. It was right. a guide, it was a guide. It line. was a guide, you know, left to right and right to left, otherwise you'd have everybody chasing each other. Yeah. You know, all the, all the wrong way around. Yeah, all, I suppose we're all, all, they, all they end up in a big crash if you watch stuff on TV <laughs> today. The directions are so bad half the time, and you, you think, really, where are you? So you worked on... For your eyes, you both worked on Fury Eyes Only. Yes. Carol Bouquet. Very pretty. God, she had lovely. Oh, sorry, she was lovely. <laughs> very lovely, pretty. Very but pretty. Very pretty. Not the best of actresses. No, it's a bit thick. She was living. Well, I've got to be careful what I say. She was mm -hmm. living with some mm -hmm. drug addict, which was a shame because it was very difficult for John. Oh no, for Lewis that was, wasn't it? No, it was John. Oh, was John. It John? Well, John. Which one was that? Which one was Carol? Yes. Your eyes oh, for your only. eyes only, yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, she did some, some really good scenes. I mean, it's difficult. She didn't like Roger, unfortunately. And I don't know, never, never asked Roger whether, or never did ask Roger whether he got on with her. But she blotted her copybook with a company because... Uh, do you want to hear that story? Oh, I do, but I don't uh, know whether we... I don't know where... No, where's, it, where's it going? No, no, okay. <laughs> no I, I can tell you it was true. It was a true story. There's nothing untrue about it. I mean, we used to, uh, for the sound effects, the, what, we, what we called footsteps, or what they call, what do they call it Foley. now? Foley's. We used to do it in France, because there were two guys there that, that um, was it, um, Jean-Pierre Lelong and... Yeah. And something or other, whatever they were, anyhow, and they were fantastic. And what we do, we would, we would go over there. I'd stay in a hotel, and run the picture with them and discuss what Colin or whatever the guys wanted film. Because we had to do for a Bond film, you have to do absolutely everything. Every single because movement. every single movement again, unless unless um, purely before the foreign versions in different languages. So we go over there, and then they would produce all this, and then. We'd, I'd go back and check it and then ship it back to Colin and this, that and the other. This, this was my perk that I had out there. And Jenny and I, my wife and I, went out there um, and because he was going to take us out to dinner to the most, one of the most fantastic restaurants in Paris because he'd made a lot of money on it, the, the footstep guy. And he, uh, when we got to this restaurant, um, he said to Jenny, well, you sit here, and, and Jenny sat next to two of the, the other recorders who didn't speak English. Well, Jenny speaks some French, but that was all right. And then I was sat over there and with a chair next to me and, 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 and the other guy there. And I said, well, what's going to happen? And then I got a sudden very uncomfortable feeling I was being set up. And who should come in but Carol? Carol Bouquet looking like one million dollars in this dress, polka dot, red and white dress, absolutely, you know, every boy's dream or man's dream of this wonderful girl came down and sat next to me, gave me a big hug and a kiss. I didn't know her. I don't really know any, rarely, I mean, she was, anyhow, sat down and we started talking and we said, oh, I've got to be careful how I eat now, I mustn't dribble or, <laughs> and then she turned to me and said, why aren't I going to the premiere? And I didn't know. I said, well, I'm sure you are. She said, no, I'm not going to the premiere. I didn't think it would end like this. So anyhow, that completely ruined my evening because I, they, I'd been set up by John Glenn because he said, let John explain to her. <laughs> I didn't know. I was quite honest about it. I said, well, I'm sure you are coming. But evidently she'd said some remark that, you know, like kissing, like kissing your grandfather or something, something, I don't know what she said, but fell out with the production company. And so she didn't come. But, she, God, she was lovely. 
but no photographs. We never had, I would have loved to have been photographed with her. But, you know, nowadays everybody takes selfies and all, all this rubbish, but nothing, it was, this was just something that happened. Working on, working on Bond film, can you just give us an example of like the airship, of, of, of how much latitude you had compared to other films in terms of... The airship for me was a, was a wonderful experience. Um, as, you pre, uh, as you appreciate, uh, a lot of it was air-to-air -air stuff, all shot over San Francisco using the Fuji airship. Now, from, for a lot of films, we draw upon sound libraries for certain sound effects. There, is no, there are no sound effects at all anywhere in any library of airship engines like was used for the film. So uh, I went to the office and I said, we're going to need to record the airship. And they said, OK, we'll set it up. So uh, the office set it up. Uh, they contacted uh, Cardington, which is the airbase for the airship industries in this country um, and explain the situation because they had the identical airship as was shown in San Francisco. So we arranged that uh, the pilots would come down to Pinewood. I would run the sequence, the whole airship sequence for the film and uh, said what we wanted to do and the, uh, they were absolutely amazed and they went away very bemused about what they were expected to do, but also excited at the challenge because it's something totally different for whatever they were doing in their everyday lives. So uh, came the day, um, uh, my colleague and I, who was also the sound recordist, um, we arrived at Cardington on a beautiful clear blue sky day, not a puff of wind anywhere, and they dragged the airship out and we then started to talk about how I wanted to approach uh, the uh, recording. Now, our problem was that um, we couldn't use walkie-talkies between us because obviously that would pick up at the time of recording. So we had to work out a series of arm movements and signals using my arms and, and hands and whatever as to what I wanted to do. So anyway, we set it up and off they went and I'd say, right, go down there. I explained initially, go down there, you know, half a mile and then come towards me and then I will do this. You, so you speed up the engines and I'll go like that, like that to, to, to uh, go faster and over the top. And then I, I will say, I'll, I'll do this and I want you to circle round. And then I, then I would go like that and you would go away. And um, this was absolutely fantastic. I, at times I must have looked like a demented traffic <laughs> cop in New York doing all these weird, all these weird signals. Anyway, so we got all the exterior work done. Then came the exciting time of climbing into the Lagonda underneath, which was like climbing into a small minibus. I think there were about eight to ten seats. And we said, right, OK, what we want to do now is to cover the interiors. So um, they said, OK, so we, we, they, they rose up to about 500 feet and stopped. And I said, right, OK, now what I want you to do is to do this, that and the other. But while I was talking to them, they were just adjusting the, they were adjusting the ballast I discovered afterwards. And we were there and the airship went down about 35 degrees. So I'm sitting here like this, saying, and what we want to do is... <laughs> But, but, and they, but they changed the ballast and sort of brought it brought back to normal again. And then we went off doing exactly the same thing again, speeding up, slowing down, um, which we, we then covered the interiors. We then came back to a stop and then we went outside when the airship was static. And I said, All right, I want you to, uh, we want to close up the engine, speeding up, slowing down, running and whatever. 
So we covered all these ventures. So we've got the exterior, we've got the interior, and we've got the individual elements of the engines. Um, and then went back and then applied it to the, to the cut sequence. And God bless them, I'm glad to say it worked out absolutely fantastic. You would never know, you know, by, by putting these sounds over what was sometimes model shots as well and the interiors and all everything that was involved on the fight on the bridge the revving up and the and the mayhem that ensued on that sequence and it worked out extremely well did you record in stereo or mono uh, we, we, it was basically it was two track recording yes um, but i think we we didn't really sort of use much of the mono aspect of it you know we used the the full stereo to, to maximum effect right and can you just explain another, another one on, on a similar thing was the, was the sound of the Mujahideen in, in Living Daylights because you had to get in real Afghanistan voices, did you? And uh, yes, we did. Oh, that um, was Peter Musgrave. Yes, he was that, fantastic. That, that, that was our, down to our dialogue editor. Um, you, oh, don't get, you don't get many Afghan actors <laughs> uh, uh, in this country today. And uh, I can't remember, somebody went trawling around and found, uh, should we say, uh, restaurants, restaurants that had Afghan yeah. Illegal uh, waiters immigrants. and waitresses. Yes. Illegals. Illegals, yeah. yes. Yeah. And um, asked them, and they came to uh, the studio, and once again, we, we were going to the recording studio, run the sequence, and they would then stand there absolutely amazed, never having done it. And it was explained what we wanted to do about the shouts and sort of, but we had to warn them don't use any don't use any swear words because we wouldn't know if there was any, any swear words for all the various shouts in the battle and whatever and bless him because of the, uh, the the wonderful work from our dialogue editor who covered that sequence it worked out extremely well Very challenging, and uh, at the end of the day, I think the guys themselves enjoyed doing it because of an awful lot of shouting and battle of shouts and cries, but no, it was most enjoyable. How would you know if they had said any bad words? Well, we don't. Well, we've on, never, there's on, never been any feedback uh, well, on, on way, pretty, from the Afghan embassy. On Pretty Polly, shot in Singapore, which Frank Clark cut when I was an assistant on it, we had uh, some Singapore dialogue or some strange dialogue at which we left in the picture we thought it was local patois. patois or something anyhow when the premiere of that film which was god knows how many years ago now there was a big burst of laughter in this quite serious scene and we didn't know what it was and then we found out in the end someone that the, the the patois or whatever track we'd used behind it was how many more fucking times we're going to do this <laughs> <laughs> but in the local language. <laughs> so you have to be careful. It, anyhow, it wouldn't happen today. No. So, during the Living Daylights, um, there's a story that the, the, uh, the work print got... Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a bit about that? About well, I that? mean, that, that, was, interesting. that was really frightening because basically, I mean, it was all, it was on, the picture was on film, you know, not digitally. Well, digitally you can steal very easily, but film you can't. You've got to take it away somewhere and physically run it and re-record it or duplicate it somehow. So uh, when we, I got called over the office by Tom Pevsner and Cubby saying there is a, a print available on video, a video, or, it VHS's, was, yeah. or a VHS as it was then, of, of the film. And of course, we are number one suspects. We're in the cutting rooms. You know, we're the only ones that have access to it. But having been very conscious about security and Matt, my assistant, we, what we used to do every time it went for, say, the Morris Binder to have or whoever was doing the trailer, 
we would send only bits of the film, nothing, we never sent the whole film. And on this particular case, because it was only dialogue scenes, no action at all, because it was purely for people to translate and to start getting ahead ready. But what we used to do, we would, during a sequence of it, whatever, we would put a particular mark on a frame and make a note of it on each reel that went out had this mark on it, which the labs used to do later on on their prints to stop them being stolen. But uh, we did this, and so we got the thing in and we worked out and we found out it had been copied and duplicated in New York by the trailer company, which went immediately went bust. They, they, they closed down because they lost the contract. But the picture was, was only a dialogue. But it, it was a really frightening time because, you know, that's the whole film. This way. On Moonraker, mm. you were talking about the space. There's lots of special effects of laser butt blasts. Yes. How did you manage to, to work out those, those special effects? Well, that, that, effects? that, as you say, that was a challenge in itself. We were trying to work out what we were going to do about it. And I was talking to, I think it was Bill Cartledge then. Um, he knew uh, of a guy who had a piece of uh, equipment that he thought might work. Uh, so uh, he introduced me to this guy uh, and I explained what I wanted. And it, so we arranged that we would go to CTS Wembley, the music recording studio, and he would turn up with his equipment and uh, we would just play around with sounds. So uh, along with my colleague Alan, we, we, we got there and um, we said, look, we, we've shown you the lasers, but we need a sound to go with it. So how are we going to approach it? So he started doing very musical notes, sustained musical notes. We said, no, that's not strong enough. That's too weak. That's and it was by process of elimination. We eventually came up with this particular tone because we had to make a difference between the, the laser pistols, the laser guns, the laser rifles, the laser cannons. Um, so we've said, okay, we could use those for the laser pistols and let, let's change the tone of it slightly for the laser gun and for the laser rifle and laser gun. And so we ran off these lengths of, of this particular tone. You didn't even know how long they were going to be. No, because no. Because we got the shots in. No. And so uh, in those days, um, the, each laser shot was applied optically in the laboratories. So the, each laser shot was probably about two or three frames long. So each one had to be applied individually. So we were working on 35 mil, so you've got hundreds and hundreds of, of tracks for, for each shot individually. It's like putting multiple gunshots together and just cutting, 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 cutting. And once again, coming back to when we did play back for Cubby and Lewis, as luck would have it, they loved it and accepted it for what we'd done. These days, it would be a lot easier because with the, today's equipment, it'd be so much more uh, advantageous to use it, all these different equipment which you now have. Did they copy you from Star Wars? No. Did, they didn't copy your no. style? No. No. When you edited um, License to Kill, it's Which very one was that? That's the one, the second Timothy Dalton. The second Tim Dalton, okay, fine, right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did get the name right, didn't I? Yeah. Um, license spelt wrong in the States. Yes. Yeah, that was but on my scripts, the wrong spelling. The, the, the thing about it is it feels less like a, a traditional James Bond film. And mm, slightly much more, more violent. Much more violent. Yeah. Much more like Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Or, and, and they even used Michael Kamen music who had done the Die Hard series. Yeah. Do you remember any conversations about changing it from a traditional Bond film? I mean, you'd all worked, well, everybody in the team had all worked on many previously, yeah. but it really feels... Well, I mean, very he, different. He, John, had been told, or the script it had to be, you know, more updated and make it more violent. It was extremely violent. We had a lot of trouble with the censor on it because it was, you know, it was so 
I mean, we'd had violence in many bonds, but not the extreme cruel violence which we had in this. And it was, and we still had to make it family entertainment. It's aimed at it's family, so you can go and see it with your grandma. It's not a. There was no bad language. We had Tim smoking in it too, which was we have to put a disclaimer on the end because of smoking product. But he insisted on smoking, saying the bond did. Mm. So then, then he accused me of taking all these cigarettes out because I used to smoke. But every time if somebody puts a cigarette in their mouth, it's it's the sort of the first puff which gets everybody else going, and all the kids copy it. So that was a, if you watch the film, you find that he gets a cigarette out, but you, you don't see him light it or. Be, or to cut try away, and cut, yes. cut around just to take away that sort of instant. Well, they must have recognized me in the casino. They were afraid I'd warn you, spoil their plans. So you knew them? I used to work for the British government. We kept dossiers on such people. Mm. British agent. Café, senor. I knew it. Gracias. You have class. <laughs> Those men try to kill me. Who would do such a thing? Someone close to you. Cream sugar? No. At the end of the film, there's a winking fish. Whilst they, you know, Bond gets his girl, and they move to this this ornate fish, and the the eye winks. Any thoughts about, because it divides well, it's, opinion as to whether or not yeah, that's a softened joke, is it? Some people find it funny, I don't know. Mm. It's did, easy enough to do. Yeah. <laughs> did, but did you, did, how did you feel when you were editing it? Did you think it was? Well, I just, uh, that just went in, that was the part of the story. Right. I didn't really think, oh God, this is awful. No, <laughs> not then anyhow. It's only when you see it now, you think, oh God, it's a bit twee, that. It's the same like the Bond. Was that who, who put the who put the whoopee whistle over the jump? Was that you? No, that was that was Jimmy Shields. Jimmy Shields, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous when the car the cork goes through the corkscrew. Oh, it's horrible! Ruined it. It was a real shot for God's mm. sake, and he made it a joke. Yes, it, yeah, and Barry kind of admits that he didn't think that was a no. clever thing to do. But what is strange is that Cubby agreed but then kept it in mm. he didn't overrule overrule the composer and the, sa the sound uh, uh, the, the editor and that seems very odd given the fact that cubby is is so in charge of the film and, yeah. and it's on his yeah on his watch w why w was he did his was his view that it had to be you're the professionals you do what you decide i think that probably right. was i think that probably was the case it's a consensus of opinion. Yes. He, 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 he yes. would take what, you know, he'd listen to you if you didn't like something, he would listen, or mm. if Colin said something, or anybody, anybody on the film. You know, when they ran it, he ran it at crew runnings and things like that. If somebody said, oh, that's ridiculous, or... Well, or maybe somebody said, you know, well, the, the audience would love that, so they just went with it. I have a question from from a from a from a Bond fan that says he'd like like to know about repeated sound effects in the films. There's a male scream that we hear repeatedly. What where do where do they come? Who decides when it's become overused, and is it just personal choice? Um, there are there are certain sound effects uh, that uh, go through nearly all the Bond movies. Uh, the screams are one of them. The uh, Stuka uh, bomber. Stuka bomber effect on nearly every kind of aircraft and helicopter when they're going down, um, and the gunshot Bloody and dog explosions. Bark. That dog. Oh yes, and there's a famous dog bark that appears time and time again. In fact, that the, the uh, sound library was surprised at that particular dog bark. It's used in so many English films. The dog was called Oscar because they thought it deserved an Oscar because the sound effect being used so many times in so many films. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that's quite striking, especially in some of the sequences, is where there's an absence of music. Does that just come intuitively when you're just cutting it, you just think, and you put the temp track on, that you just think that actually it's better just to, to let it work and then bang the music in towards the end in a... In a because there's, there's quite a lot of sequences, like in Spy Love Me, there's a there's a there's a sequence with a whoosh in the um, uh, in the ski sequence, and then it goes quiet, 
parachute comes on, banging yes, the music. It, it's letting it breathe. Yeah. Prior oh, well, to that, that, it's like all sound. I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's the level on a Bond film, it gets so loud sometimes. You've got to have a sudden quiet place just to let people go <sighs> and just to keep the pace still or slow the pace down a bit. Otherwise, you have this terrible section in the middle where it's all wrong. Did you ever have battles between the balance of the sound and the music and... and, oh, and oh, constantly. constantly. All the that's time. That's yeah. all the time. Especially if the musician came in. Yes. That, that was then... Mm. Name um, names? No. No, John, I mean... No, John didn't come into the theatre very much. He knew that it was going to be... No, I think... Can you tell me the, the, the story on Living Daylights of John Barry actually being on the... Uh, on the rostrum, yeah. yeah. Well, we, I, uh, I was there. I was there. No, I was. Re Cubby said it was my fault. John was completely blotto, and he had to stand on this rostrum on the long shot and conduct. And and but he couldn't stand still. He was too tiddly. We, we'd had the most fantastic lunch, <laughs> and he'd had a lot of red wine. And he got it because he he can conduct. He'd, you know, that's part of his life. He just does it when he's talking. He conducts. But he got up there and they, so they nailed his shoes to the floor. But I, I mean, whether that is true or it's an apocryphal story that goes around, but it's a good story. But you were there? I was there, but I'm not, I was way up on the top, not, not, not down you, on the you floor. You were on the floor somewhere, weren't Yeah, you? I, I, was, I was sitting there <laughs> applauding when I thought of... So, one of the things that, that when we've talked previously, you've talked about the wanker reel. Will will Bond fans ever get to see any no, of this I stuff? I hope not. No. And why not? And it what, was what, a what? very personal thing. It was made that, for, for our the crew, for the unit, and it was done. We started on Spy, and it went all the way through. Half the people in it are dead. It. I mean, Roger kept trying to get it. I mean, it's still around. Barbara has it now, and I repaired it's it all. It's locking key somewhere. Uh, it's, it's, and... Um, it was, we, we digitised it and got it the best quality we could because it was wearing out. I mean, it was, it had been, oh, God. Is this one for all the films or? or no, just yes, it, it, each Bond film came through and we'd add to stuff. I mean, we lost certain things at one time, Pete on View to, on, on View to a Kill was it? He lost, somewhere it got lost. Um, when Roger was in bed, when he pulled this enormous dildo out, well, it had the real soundtrack on it which was laughter of you know, the whole crew as they pulled it out and, and, and what, what, Grace, Jones. Grace Jones, yes. It's, her and, 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 laugh. And, and her laugh and her, what are you going to do with that or something? <laughs> I don't know what it was, but, and, and that, we, I can never find that again. I, I don't know what happened to that. We, I mean, we kept all the spares of things. There's lots and, of jokes. They shot it. They shot stuff for us. In the in end, the end we, yes. In the, the end. It was like sort of designing a joke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we. I I did another one. I did one. Ken Adam, who I thought was the most fantastic art director, and loved it. He did an interview, and he was very full of himself. It was a BBC interview, and he said, "Oh, when I bought the A frames on the Sunday, and we had we got all these things." And his his his, his you know his language, and the way he did it. So, uh, I said. I'm going to make a wanker, a little special film about Ken Adams, and we play it for him at Christmas. And we did, and we had, and we found, and it all stemmed because of the whole load of spacing we had was all absolutely awful stuff from the concentration camps, of all these people working and building these stages, and this is when they were building the 007 stage. That was what it was all about. Anyhow, we built this thing up, and then uh, I, I sh uh, no. no that's right. I, I wanted, I wanted cigars, so the unit would shoot. You know, Ken out of a chair. There, the big stogie get, go down, still smoking or something like that. So they shot that for me, and this, that, and the other. And um, what was it? I'm trying to think. Well, anyhow, I got a bit worried about it because it was so uh, anti-Jewish or, or or so or very Germanic or Germanic or no, it, it was not anti-Jewish. It was it was Germanic, wasn't it? It was you know. And it was a bit unfair, but we were taking the piss out of him, really. So anyhow, I, I said to John, I mean, John knew I was doing it, and, and um, he said, we, we, I don't think we should show this. 
I'll tell you what, we'll show it to Cubby. Cubby saw it and roared with laughter. He got us, put it on the end of rushes today. And of course, Ken Adams had no idea it was coming up, and then this film came up. Everybody was a bit, mm, ooh, a bit <laughs> stunned <laughs> uh, with his dialogue going over. And then, yeah, Ken came over to me and he said, I will never forget this. <laughs> and he didn't. So every time I saw him, I mean, he's dead now, but every time I saw him, I promised him it would never go anywhere, and it never did. It was done just for the unit, yeah. but it's and the, he really loved it because it, he knew he was it, had the piss taken. It's one it. of the few. There, there are some outtakes that you found for the DVDs, but it's just seeing the outtakes and seeing the fun that Roger could, could oh, put in God, that yeah. would be nice for the fans to see. But yes. but you don't. Oh, think the Wanker all of film. It. The Wanker film was definitely only made for the yeah. crew. I mean, I could have. I'm it, it so worth I could have been sold that for millions. Say, it'd, it'd be, be all right on the night that program was oh. always phoning us up, mm. and we kept it under lock and key. No, yeah. that that's yeah. that's. Did well, as long as I'm alive, that will never go out, mm -hmm. and I hope Barbara won't put it out either. Yeah, it, well, they did. They did steal something from it when uh, um, they took it out. Uh, when um, what's who's the Q died. They, we had one there where it all went wrong on the bed, oh, rolled it. Well, Desmond, they, they, Desmond yeah. and, and and they showed this uh, at his funeral or, or whatever, what, what his his tribute film. So I know that's fine. And what was the other thing? Because he was, I mean, Roger was so funny with Q. So because because Desmond. Because there's this this whole thing where he invented oh. a whole load of script oh, to make yeah. you do it. Was, oh, that, that, was that in the rank of real? No, because that no, would be because too that time consuming. Done, yeah, yeah. That, that, the wanker film was very short cut. Very, very And it's all done to, cuts, you know, yeah. I'm a wanker living on the train, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Kill Joe, grab that man, grab him, hold him. Grab that man, hold him. Damn it, we need some help. Let go, let me go, damn it, there's a bomb in there. You Let me go. Let me go. Let him go. Quiet, everyone. Quiet. When you look back at all, all, all your time on Bond films, how would you kind of sum up what, what it was like working on for this amazing company and doing these I amazing... Think, I think I was very privileged, very lucky. Yes. Lucky to be around and lucky for John to ask me at that initial time. And that's yeah. hard work. It's a lot of my life. Yeah. For God's sake, we got on those pictures and they were nine, nine months, basically, and in which I'd never go home. Mm -hmm. So you, you had to have a good family behind you. I keep saying that, keep my wife, and still, <laughs> if she ever sees it. But um, no, but, but uh, uh, having done as many bonds as we have done, uh, you become part of the the, the, uh, the family of of Bond, and you know the fact that you're invited back time and time again sure. speaks for itself. And to be invited back that many times, we feel privileged to have been part and parcel of them. It came from Cubby, yes. basically. Cubby, if he liked you, mm. Cubby would do anything for you. It, it, it seems that also uh, Roger created a nice atmosphere on the set. Yes, very relaxed. Any, any aggravation, something goes wrong, Roger would disappear out and, or send his man out or something and come back with a case full of sweets. Or he, he'd lark around. Or yeah. he would, but then Tim didn't do that. Tim was much more serious. And did, did it suffer because of the of the seriousness or do you think it was because oh, you can still make a serious film and have fun yeah he i don't know i mean i mean i liked he's much more athletic you know he was very athletic but he he didn't seem to have the sense of fun and the script the first script was written for roger um pierce brosson we did his tests he would have been i didn't do pierce any of his pictures and uh, I think he would, he, he's got more of a tongue-in-cheek 
but Tim was wanting to be really serious. If you remember Carol Bouquet, she had the, 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 the yellow 2C and 2CV, which was used for the car chase. Well, of course, as we know, a 2CV only has a 600cc engine in it. So for the purposes of a chase, the car was re-engineered and had a Citroen 1220 GS Club engine put in it, which, and then so that was used for the chase. But most of the chase scene in that uh, was all done by a second unit without any sound. So we, I had to then uh, go out and record and a apply to, to the, the real Dershavar. Yes. So um, anyway, we arrived one cold November morning um, it, uh, in an airfield out in Buckinghamshire somewhere. Bovington. And uh, Bovington, yes. Uh, and the guy who engineered the car was also going to be driving it, stunt driving it for the day. And he said, uh, I'll just tell you a little story before we start. He said, uh, I thought I'd just road test the car on the evening before the recording uh, to make sure everything was okay. So he went out of the studio, round and round about, and down a dual carriageway heading towards Slough. He came up behind a Ford console and he flashed to, take, uh, to overtake. The console put his foot down. He flashed him again to overtake and the console kept on putting his foot down. Four times he flashed in the console. Eventually, the, the console did pull over and the 2CV overtook him doing 93 miles an hour and still accelerating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you imagine that the driver sort of uh, in the pub that night telling his friends that he'd been overtaken by a 2CV <laughs> de so, Which was a lovely story. <laughs> Was a, there were two other films that you worked on for you and Lloyd. One was Wild Geese and the other one was Who Dares Wins. Yeah. Well, they were fun pictures. They, they, yeah. they looked good. They, we're, they were great fun. Lovely crews. and yeah. they, they were like a Bond. I mean, yeah. Ewan was exactly like a... He was trying to... He was a publicist originally, but became producer. Or, mm. And he was like Cubby. But he never had enough money. Mm. That was the unfortunate thing. But Wild Geese, I mean, is a... The stars in that... Oh, well, do you have any? Do you how have do you, any? How do you get that sort of star quality together? Well, is there any stories about because because the, they were all supposed to be off the juice, weren't they? Because they were worried about Richard Harris. Oh, yes. Because he was he had a reputation. Oh, no, he ruined well. the Golden Rendezvous. Burton so as well. I can well, tell Burton. you, Richard Harris. We were doing ADR with him, and I was I was taking the session because my dialogue editor was doing something else. We were in the theatre, and in between real changes, uh, Richard Harris sort of starts something, and he do kung fu kicks towards my face just for a laugh and some of them got very very close I mean all credit to him that he was able to judge it but <laughs> it wasn't a funny moment <laughs> but that apart everybody else was absolutely fine but there well, I mean we were shooting in Northern Transvaal I mean we went out there and John was John was second unit director and editor and it was the most isolated place god it was and snakes all over the place, and we lived in Rondals. We had, we had a swimming pool, that's right, yeah. It was a holiday place, I suppose it was, anyhow, and by, by, the, uh, by the border of, I don't know, northern, it was in northern Transvaal, wherever it was. And we had this uh, huge aircraft on the runway, which I went up in several times when we pushed the people The Hercules, out. yeah. The Hercules, which was, which was fun. Um, what else was, oh, Andrew McLaglen, yeah, he was giant of a man and, and, and he would tear pages out of a script if he got behind. Mm. <laughs> but and, and Andrew, it's interesting you say, Andrew was six foot five, um, John Wayne was six foot four and Andrew maintained he was the only man who was able to look down on John Wayne. Wow. <laughs> I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business.
you sound. And you did. Colin, John, thank you so much for sharing your memories with us. That's been really great. Thank you very much. It, it, well, it has been our pleasure. Yeah, and, and I am, um, yeah, okay, fine. They are all true, which is bad. <laughs> okay. But, but thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you both. That's Cut. Cut. Brilliant.